Okay, my name is Richard Fordenberger. As uh, Patrick said, I'm the, uh, I guess my official title is the Energy and Resource Coordinator for the farm. Uh, when I came here, we pretty, pretty much um, three and a half years ago maybe, the farm was you know, intensely involved in agriculture and soil science and all the things we do and we know of as the farm, but um, I guess I brought to it, in addition to the people at the biogas plant, which is on, at our other location, brought to it the energy aspect, uh, the growth in that, the analysis, the, uh, I don't wanna say off-grid because not everything is, is off-grid, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's part of it. Um, so that would include like, solar energy, infrastructure, water pumping, uh, green building. I'd like to really, you know, add, I've, I've had, I've worked in an architectural office. I've done a lot of stuff with green building and cordwood masonry and other things. So I would really like to um, incorporate some of that into things as we're going along. And we are now building, replacing a large greenhouse that collapsed in the snow. Uh, and we're replacing with two smaller ones, almost the same total size. Um, and there's some energy efficient um, and common sense applications or, or embodiments in there that are going up, which we probably wouldn't have done, you know, six years ago. So, um, so that's pretty much that. Um, my background in, in um, methane and biogas had basically been a long time ago. I was employed by the Mother Earth News. I was, the, I was hired as an editor, but I ended up running their research and development department. So we built a lot of things, and one of them on our property, we had a 624-acre piece of research property in Transylvania County. One of them was... Um, a very small methane digester. And prior to that, we had, I hadn't, but other staff people had built a much larger one at a site in Indiana, but it, we were trying to make it smaller and make it more accessible to people. Uh, I ran that thing, it did not particularly work very well, but I, I learned what I could, and I really hadn't paid much attention other than visiting and, and talking to people who had done it mostly in the Midwest until really recently, when uh, these folks, at this company, Home Biogas, it's an Israel-based. Um, they're on a kibbutz in um, in the no, I guess northern north eastern part of the uh, on the coastal area of Israel. This is not going to be a workshop about the Home Biogas unit. It's going to be a workshop on biogas. The relationship between the Home Biogas and unit and our um, biogas research is that they we are basically doing a beta test with them or for them. Um, and we uh, are not the only ones. Appalachian State University, their sustainable technology department is, also has a unit. They're doing some testing and there's other people around the country that are doing it. The reason being that in Israel and many of the places where they sell these things, uh, it's, it's pretty warm, it's pretty hot actually. And the seasonal climate can remain warm. And if, if anything, biogas digesters love a warm environment. So. It works great in Israel, it works great in the Philippines, and it works great in South America, wherever. We, they really weren't sure how it was gonna work here in the States. So that's part of our goal here. Test, test for them, test with them, exchange questions, answers, problems, uh, whatever, and then share videos, pictures, um, analysis, whatever we have. So I guess we, got, we picked this thing up back in, it's been over, a year. I guess it was, a year and two, four, three months. It was a year and three months because it was the Mother Earth News Fair, not this year, but the year before that. They had a display. Patrick jumped in and said, we need one of those. We had a conversation. We got one of those. And um, I didn't set it up right away because I, we, had to have, we were going to put it in the greenhouse because I knew that would be an enclosure safe, uh, not entirely heated, but it would be a lot better than just outside. Um, for, un, I guess fortunately for us, we did not put it in the greenhouse because the greenhouse collapsed. So the one greenhouse collapsed, so uh, snow load in the, in the winter. So um, I built a little house for it at the end of our tool shed, which we'll see down there. It's just really, it's, it's uh, insulated on the, it's a deck, a very strong deck because the weight of that, it's actually over 2,600 pounds total, but of course it's spread out over an area. It's about four and a half I mean, well, about four and a half feet wide and maybe seven, a little bit more, seven plus long. So it gets spread out. So we have about 80 pounds per square foot on that deck, which is a lot, but it's not, it's not ex too excessive. So it's insulated on the bottom. It's insulated to what I could in the, in the double layer of plastic on the, on the 
the glazing, and then the ends, I scavenged two uh, double-paned um, large windows at each end as part of the end walls from a friend of mine who was a carpenter, and they replaced uh, glass. He always calls me up when there's stuff like that because he doesn't throw anything away. So we did that. I made the house. I actually made it too, too short. I wish I would have. I wish I would have put that wall at the very end, but I didn't. Now it's a matter of sort of sneaking around in there, but it's, it's all right. It works. Uh, the, other, the other side of it, and this is in progress. This, these aren't recent pictures. This is probably November, maybe, of last year. So that's how big it is. It's not very big. So, you know, the goal was to test the thing. And, uh, you know, initially, I think we, Pat and I had a conversation. I said, we, this is probably three years ago. I said, we really need to make a biomethane biogas digester. Yeah, but I was thinking of a big one, and Pat reminded me, we don't have enough manure to, I mean, we use it. We make compost. You know, we, we, we use it. But this is small enough that it gives us a great test. We have horses, um, and uh, the initial startup, the, 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 uh, the starter, is, is a manure, and then from that point on, you feed um, table scraps, vegetable scraps, garden culls, uh, food waste, you know, whatever. And there's a, we'll get into that uh, as we go on. So, you know, essentially it's, a, it's a, a little digester that we put about two pounds of food into a day. I mean, that's ideal. I, haven't, I didn't feed it today. We're going we're gonna to feed it at the end of the day. The, the workshop's going to be about using kitchen and garden wastes to make a burnable gas, obviously. Um, and the other benefit of the machine, and not just, not just this unit, but any methane digester, is it also makes a liquid effluent that makes excellent fertilizer and actually makes better fertilizer than what went into it due to the chemical action of what happens in the digestion process. And then at the end of the cycles, after so many cycles or after, at, at, it just depends on how you want to run it, it also has a solid um, element to it. And you can, we actually clean out the solid waste and use that in a compost pile or as we need to. The nutrients will remain, pretty much remain, the nutrients that go into it come out of it. So that's a real plus. Not 100%, not but very close. If you're using that leachate, treat it as if it's raw manure. Right. And it's not composted in a way that you have reduced further pat pathogens. You have to actually treat it like raw manure, which is fine. You can do that. That's just the 90 days if it doesn't touch the, if it doesn't touch the plant, um, and 120 if it does. And, and uh, as an addendum to that, temperatures in, in this unit are not hot enough. It's not, it's not a thermophilic. It's not the 130 and 135 degree temperatures that you might find in some compost piles. It, so that element, it doesn't exist, so we don't have that cleansing action. Ideally, it runs uh, about 95 degrees. Uh, that's, that's hopeful. Um, it, the, the rules, the, the, you know, the guidelines are 68 degrees Fahrenheit is the low end, and that's really pushing it. Um, I, I wouldn't, it, it doesn't work very well at that low. Um, they would prefer about 80, 80, and then 95 is actually primo. So we're working in that 80 to 95 degree Fahrenheit uh, range. That's not enough to kill, the temperature alone is not enough to kill the pathogen. So, you know, Patrick made a good point there. However, some of the other biological action will take care of a lot of things. Um, depending on what you're looking for, it, it can cleanse uh, probably up to about 95% of, of the pathogens, but not, certainly not all of them. Um, so, you know, that's, that's just, I'm just putting that out there. Um, anaero we're going to talk about how, what anaerobic digestion is and, and how it works. We're going to talk about best practices in operating something like this and, the, and the, just the, you know, hard facts about it. It's not an automatic process. I mean, it does have to be um, babysat, but not horribly. Uh, it's not like an hour-by-hour -hour thing, but it does have to be uh, attended. Um, and then we'll talk about the uh, appropriate materials, the kind of materials we'd use to build one, because again, this is not a workshop about the, that only that one we have out there. We're talking about the ability to be able to use gathered materials or found materials or scavenged or purchased materials to make things like tanks and, and uh, other things to make, um, uh, to make a unit. And then um, uh, I will talk about what is, you know, allowed, or well, not allowed, but what is uh, a good application, you know, concrete block, brick, EPDM rubber, uh, PVC rubber, or PVC uh, fabric, uh, um, 
ABS tanks, metal steel tanks, uh, fiberglass tanks, whatever. So that's the kind of thing we'll be talking about. And then um, uh, we'll, we'll address, talk a little bit about the expectations that don't, you know, not to get, not to oversell it, um, uh, but but to also uh, acknowledge that it is it has its place and it is it is a practical thing. It's not just a toy. It's a you know, it's a, it's a cute little thing out there, but it's not, it is functional. So, you know, that's, that's that. And, you know, the only reason I'm going to harp on uh, probably more than I should on that particular one is because that's what we got. And that's, it's little and it's, it's manageable. And, um, uh, you know, in some cases, certain aspects of designing a system or, or using a system or putting money into a system can be limited by the fact that uh, y you may not, you may have too many animals to, work with a little one, or you may, if you build one too big, you may not have enough livestock to feed um, what you got, uh, or not just livestock, but, um, you know, but the vegetable matter or whatever. So uh, this is great because we have a school here, kids eat, there's scraps from the eating maybe, there's uh, a lot of, like right now we have a lot of tomato waste, uh, you know, I have this, we'll be, we'll be mixing that up, you know, that's just like some smashed up ones, I found some out there, that one of them has a, you know, problem, I mean, none of this is, some of these may make, might make okay sauce, but uh, you know we've got a higher a higher cause here <laughs> over there, so that's where that's going. So basically, that's what we're going to cover for the for the uh, workshop. So anaerobic digestion is essentially the breakdown of food materials, carbohydrates and nitrogen, protein, whatever, into a usable, burnable, renewable gas, and it occurs in the absence of oxygen. So it's anaerobic without oxygen. And that's different than other types of digestion which occur in the presence of oxygen. So uh, like, a, like a composting toilet or something, something that blow air into it to help, help the digestion. In the beginning, you know, you put, we have basically a tank of water, and then we put in, we put in a manure slurry to start it. That's a starter. Um, and if, there's going to be air in there. There's bubbles. There's a head space, you know, at the top of the... Our, our tank is, a, I think... A, Officially 310 gallons, and you'll be here. You'll be. I'll be switching between meters, meters, and liter. I'm, I'll try not to. I'll try to convert everything to to uh, uh, English standards. But but uh, you know between liters and meters and gallons and and cubic feet and cubic meters and and uh, and then we've got the energy values. You know BTUs, and we're going to talk about uh, uh, calories maybe. And so you know I'll try to keep it on a straight, simple line. But sometimes I might slip. Um, but we have a um, uh, headspace in there. It's going to be air in there, and that, in the process, that gets absorbed and consumed. So essentially, the system seals, and that's that's what's important. You fill it up, and you fill it up to the point where the inlet pipe and the outlet pipe are um, effectively form a water seal, a water barrier, so so that nothing can come in unless you put it in, and nothing can come out unless it's the gas. And, that's, and the design is such that the gas comes out through a tube. It doesn't come out any other way. In our system, the effluent, well, in any system, the effluent comes out, but it's also always, the effluent's the liquid fertilizer, basically. It'll come out, but it won't come out. Um, it's, it's still sealed as it comes out. It maintains that seal. So uh, um, essentially what's happening is the, is the me methane is developing. So the first step is hydrolysis, and that's basically... Uh, Carbohydrates and proteins get broken down into sugars and amino acids. So it's just a breaking down of, of co fairly complex molecular chains down into individual um, molecules. And that's the first step is water does that. And our stirring, I don't have the stir down. It's down at the, at the building, the little house there. But uh, uh, basically we mechanically stir. It could be a pump to do it. It could be a, could be a I use a paint mixer with our little system. It's just a, a drywall mixer. Um, it could be a stick, mortar and pestle, it could be a shovel. I mean, just basically chop it up, chew it up, and put water in it, and it just, it just breaks it, you know, breaks it up. The second step is, is um, acidogenesis, and that basically breaks down these, these simple single molecules of sugar and acids into, into ethanol and fatty acids. So that produces carbon dioxide, and that occurs in, in the tank itself. It's nothing, once it's in there, there's nothing you can do about it, I mean, except, except for maintaining... Um, you know, proper conditions, which we'll talk about. Um, so what happens is carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide, which is, uh, which is a sort of a rotten egg smelling gas, get produced. 
And you can't escape that. I mean, at the end of the day, we, we try to remove that because it's fairly uh, corrosive at, at the end of the process. But, um, but in, the, in the working of the process, that, that is an important aspect of it. Um, acetogenesis is the production of acetic acid and uh, carbon dioxide. And we have hydrogen, which is flammable. And it, it's, that is taken from the ethanol and the fatty acids. So that acetic uh, business just you know, is another step in the conversion. We don't have to really worry about it. I mean, it's, you know, a chemist, a, a chemical uh, engineer may worry about it if he's trying to improve the function or the performance of the, of the uh, digester, but you know, we're, it's already set up for us, so we just let it, let it roll. We give it, we give it the, the proper temperature and the proper environment, and it's gonna, it's gonna work. Um, and the important part then is the, is the methanogenesis, which is the actual creation of the methane. And that's, you know, that's the most important part. These ethanol and the fatty acids are, or the, uh, the uh, microorganisms turn whatever is in there in the way of hydrogen and acetic acid into methane and some other um, elements, but, but the two major ones are methane and carbon dioxide. So our gas composition is essentially gonna be anywhere from about 50, maybe 55% to 70% methane and about 30, I think I'm gonna say 30 to 45% carbon dioxide. Of course, not the high end of any of those, but I mean, it's a balance. So basically, what I'm looking at is, is maybe a 60% 60, 60 methane, 38% carbon dioxide, and the balance is gonna be in hydrogen, nitrogen, and just other uh, trace gases, um, water vapor, that kind of thing. How does that compare to natural gas? Well, natural gas, it comes from all over the country. I mean, you know, Texas comes from Oklahoma, Louisiana, wherever. Um, it'll cha it'll vary, but not very very much. It'll be about 89 to 91 percent um, methane. So we're saying 90 percent methane from the purchased gas that you get from the natural gas, and about 60 percent methane in our system. I, I, I haven't been able to measure it yet because the the, uh, the chronometer that measures it's very expensive, and we, we don't have one. I have, to, I have to borrow it or have somebody do it for us or get a sample. But it's, I'm going to say it's about 60%, 62%, because it, it was burning. Okay. Um, Appalachian State folks uh, in their unit, which they've been running pretty consistently for a lot longer than this one, they're, they're analyzing it at 65%. And in some uh, agricultural units with larger systems where they're actually very well engineered and 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 pretty precisely controlled, they're running, they're pushing 70%, and that's about it. But still, 70% to 90, compared to 90%, that's pretty close. And it's a totally renewable gas. You know, not, it's not mined or, or fraction, you know, fracked or, 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 or converted from petroleum or anything like that. It's a, it's a, it's a good gas. This stuff will burn, our stuff will burn, um, you know, quite nicely, biogas. And I just will say, I'll add on that, um, Investors and companies are actually making what they call biomethane, or uh, see, I was going to say, I, th I forget the other word. It's biomethane, which is essentially natural gas made from methane, made from biogas. Natural gas made from biogas, and it's actually getting sold, sent into the normal lines, into the normal gas channels, piping, and um, you know, mixed in with every, everybody else's. Uh, petroleum natural gas, and, and it's, you know, it's fine. And that's been going on for a little while now, and I don't expect it will get uh, any smaller. There'll probably be more and more of that as we, as we can do that. So uh, it's not, this is not a crazy idea. This is something that's been happening in India, Pakistan, China, Philippines, um, Central America, other places, and even, well, even in Pennsylvania. Penn State has excellent programs, and I have them uh, in the resources here, the handout. So why would we want to do this? Well, you know, we've got, uh, you know, the short version is we essentially we have the accumulation of raw manures causes leaching of, um, you know, phosphorus, nitrogen, some other things that normally could be put to use, but, but just the straight leaching of it in, into the soil in a pile, especially in these, um, some of these intensive uh, uh, operations, is just not a good thing. It's an environmental, um, you know, drawback. It's not a, it's not a benefit. So converting, um, converting that material into something useful not only removes the problem, but it also gives us you know, something more usable, like uh, uh, you know, gas. And also, um, 
the fertilizer. It's, it's not just a liquid effluent, which is, which is a good fertilizer, but we also have the solid effluent, which can be managed and, and, and used as a solid or a slurry um, uh, fertilizer. The, in the larger units, like some of the uh, larger university units or, or some of the large um, operations, they actually sort of recycle some of that effluent back into the tank. We don't do that. I, wouldn't, I probably wouldn't know. I've never done that, so I probably wouldn't know exactly how to do it. But um, that sort of, I'm, I'm sort of trying to, think of a, trying to think of a parallel, but it sort of feeds, it's a feedback loop basically, and it sort of helps the, the whole thing continue to remain useful to itself. And uh, so that's another little section of it that, um, you know, that is a use. Yeah? If you distill it and you ferment, and then you take some of you. It's a, you that's a good example. Yeah. And put yeah. it back in your new. Put it back in for the alcohol, exactly, for ethanol. You basically, to raise the proof of ethanol or alcohol, or I'm going to say ethanol. I'm, I'm talking about to, to put the biologicals back in. Yeah, yes. that's what I was thinking. Oh, okay. Is that yeah. why exactly. they're doing it? Are they doing it for that? For the yeah, it's, it's very much like that. Inoculant, and it's also giving itself a taste of what you're what it's supposed to be like so it knows when you put new stuff in. This is what your, this is your community. This is. Be like this, you know. That's that's it exactly. Yeah. Let me see what the other thing is that methane. We've all heard uh, rumin, uh, ruminants like cattle and buffalo and other animals are a big problem with the enteric methane. It's their you know their their gas and their burping and all that. It sounds ridiculous, but in intensive farming and and the amount of that that goes on in South America and our country and a lot of places, um, that is a fairly that's a major contribution to uh, greenhouse gases and. Um, uh, you know, this is, um, methane is, is a lot more potent. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very potent uh, form of, uh, of uh, greenhouse gas problem. So, you know, we really don't want free methane floating around. So being able to digest uh, the manures and turn it into useful gas is, is helpful. Um, I'm trying to get some of these numbers here. Uh, ammonia, that's another thing. Volatized ammonia, you know, off-gassing of ammonia and whatever. The, the uh, digestion of the manures resolves that because it's immediately being transferred from the animal's lot uh, or whatever, the, wherever the animals are, into the digester so we don't have it laying around and off-gassing ammonia. Um, the ammonia will break down beneficially into the effluent and we use it as fertilizer. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's a, a fairly important aspect. Um, and the other thing is just the energy. Uh, it's, it's, you know, on a larger scale, on a, on a working farm, you may have, um, I think the Penn State model has a, a 100, is it 100 cubic meter digester. I mean, it's fairly, very large, and I don't know how many head of cattle. I mean, it's quite a few. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, in the hundreds. And, um, and so... In that operation, you actually have so much gas. I think you know they, they make an incredible amount of gas per day, uh, per animal. So you have um, not only you know an immense amount of of burnable fuel, but you also have beyond the fertilizer and the effluent, you also have so much gas that we can we can not just think about heating, um, you know, stoves, but we're talking about uh, potential lighting. We're talking about refrigeration because there's Absorption chiller refrigerators that actually work on heat. They turn heat into cold. Uh, commercial units, industrial units. There's um, engines. Engines, uh, it's not a particularly efficient conversion, but, it's, but it works. Um, uh, essentially, the number there, if I remember correctly, is basically six units of methane are converted into a little more than two units of energy. And so you're losing quite a bit. But, but if you need a rotating shaft, if you need horsepower, yeah, it's a great deal. You know, we also have things like, um, you know, space heating and um, and um, can think of other things. I probably lighting. light. Well, lighting, yeah, small lighting. Uh, craft operations. The what? Craft operations like pottery kilns. Oh yeah, yeah, kilns. Yeah, that's what they do in uh, up at the uh, Yancey County. I guess they had that operation up there, uh, off their landfill. Uh, landfills will generate methane as well. They sink pipes into the ground and, and just draw it through uh, perforated pipes and process it and run it in generators. And burn it. Yeah. <laughs> well, they run. Yeah, they run 15, 20 years and it's run out, but still, that's, for 15, 20 years, everything is great. The party's over. 